Okay. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our chocolate tasting. We're going to spend a few minutes waiting for people to come in. Uh, it's been fun watching people check in via the YouTube chat. Uh, it's great to see we've got people from all over the, the states. We should have some folks joining from uh, Canada and South Korea, I think, shortly. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll wait until we get a couple more minutes past the hour. Okay, um, let's get started. So welcome everyone to our online uh, chocolate tasting. So I, um, I want to just, sorry? Sorry, I'm sorry, is it, I'm sorry, what's the, is it, is there, you can't hear me? You hear Sam? Yeah, I think everybody, I think it's okay. All right, thumbs, thumbs up from people on the Zoom other than Malu, okay. Oh. So okay now because you're gonna be able to you'll you'll need to be able to hear me later. Is it excuse us just one minute. <laughs> Having run enough of these on, these uh, Zoom online events, I now I just know that there's always going to be something, and so I, I, I feel very feel ready for it. Okay, so we're just wait one more minute until one of our co-presenters will be logging back in, in in just a second. Okay. Is that better, Malu? Terrific. Okay. All right. Let's begin again. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to our online chocolate tasting. Uh, my name is Sam Sober. Oh, actually, before I talk, before I introduce myself, let me very briefly introduce all of the other people who are on this call. We're going to meet them in a, a lot more detail in a few minutes. Um, so I'm one of the co-instructors of the course uh, at Emory for which the, this is this is sort of the final class project. Um, I'm joined by uh, Maha Rashid and Malu Murrigan, who are my co-instructors. Uh, we also have all of the students from the class here. We're going to be hearing a lot more from them uh, in a few minutes. And then we have our very special guests, um, Matt and Elaine from Jocolato Chocolate. They are the chocolatiers who made this beautiful chocolate um, that, that you have in front of you. Um, okay, so as I said, um, I'm a, a professor in the, the biology department at Emory. Um, I'm really excited to talk to all of you tonight about the neuroscience of deliciousness um, as told through chocolate. Um, we have a really fantastic lineup of presenters, as I just mentioned, um, and most importantly, uh, we and, and you all have a collection of really fantastic chocolate um, that we'll be tasting before too long. Um, before I get into the program tonight, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank a few people. Uh, the most important people to thank, of course, are the students in Biology 190. Um, I'll mention a little bit more about the class in a minute. Um, and then listed under them there are a bunch of different offices and, and bodies at Emory uh, that have helped this uh, help make this possible. Um, and especially, you know, especially appreciate that, you know, this started as a really small chocolate tasting event that was going to have about 15 people at it. Um, thanks to the, you know, the enthusiasm and the support from Emory, uh, we're now looking at roughly 1,500 people um, who, who I think are going to, who have registered and I think are going to be joining us. Um, so let's see. So I will start tonight by just giving a little bit of a background about our class. Um, and then after that, I'm going to introduce the other speakers. And these other speakers are going to have lots of cool stuff to tell you about uh, neuroscience and chocolate and the neuroscience of chocolate. Um, and so, okay, so let me let me start by just giving a, a bit of a background about um, biology 190. 
So this is a course, um, this course is a first year seminar class taught at Emory. So every Emory undergraduate uh, gets to take one of these courses in their first year. And this particular, uh, this particular first year seminar, the goal is to understand deliciousness and not just to understand deliciousness, but to understand deliciousness in two, I think, really complementary ways, which is that we typically spend the first part of this class learning about the neurobiology of how the brain perceives flavor. Um, and then usually about midway through the semester, we, we switch to talking about how chefs work with flavor and how chefs you know, use different ingredients and cooking techniques to, to create these delicious experiences. And you know, really, the, I think the, the fun of this class that you know, I hope you'll, you'll all get an, uh, an impression of is you thinking about the connections between how chefs and neurobiologists think about flavor. And I, we're gonna try to illustrate that tonight with the different chocolates. Um, so I've been teaching this class for a few years now. Um, this was a very different class before 2020. So in pre-pandemic years, this class was really built around all of us cooking side by side in a test kitchen on Emory campus on Emory's campus. Um, and then we would also do you know work in groups on these sort of neuroscience based demos. Uh, this is something illustrating the, the, the influence that sound has on our perception of, of crunchy food, essentially. Um, and then the other great part of this class uh, pre pandemic was that we would work with different chefs from the Atlanta area and they would come up with these, uh, we would come up with menus together that illustrate tasting menus that illustrated different principles of neuroscience. Um, and then they would you know, invite us into our uh, into their restaurants and we would go, you know, and we would bring them into our classrooms. So basically both of these two key elements um, became impossible to do during the pandemic. So, you know, along with my co-instructors this year, you know, we're really challenged to think, you know, to basically reconfigure the entire course. Um, so as you can see here, uh, we, you know, everything went virtual for almost the entire, you know, for almost the entire semester. And so here, you know, rather than all of our you know, students and instructors cooking together in a kitchen, this is, you know, a Zoom, an image from a Zoom call, you know, people are in their dorm rooms, uh, classrooms, offices, um, Etc. Um, and then the other thing that we we did, we needed to figure out a way to recreate these tasting experiences. Is we partnered with a bunch of different Atlanta area um, uh, food purveyors and 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 restaurants. And one of the things you're going to hear during the part of this presentation. Oh yeah, I should have mentioned part of this presentation is also part of the student's final project. So you may be eating chocolate, but you're also witnessing part of a final exam. Um, and we're, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in the rest of this presentation um, how we integrated these different, uh, these different fantastic Atlanta foods into our lessons about neuroscience. Um, so I just want to I want to briefly talk about all I'm about to, to, to step away from the presentation, um, but I want to introduce the other people who are going to present. Uh, so as I mentioned, I am one of the co-instructors of this course. The other two co-instructors are Professor Malu Morrigan, uh, who's also in the biology department uh, at Emory, and Maha Rashid, who is a graduate student in the Emory Neuroscience PhD pro uh, program. We're also, uh, the, as part of their final project, the students have created a six or seven minute long video uh, talking about some of the things we've done in the class. So you'll see presentations from them very shortly. And then later, uh, as I said, we're very lucky to have Elaine and Matt from Chocolatel here. Um, they're going to talk to us about how chocolate is made and about sort of their experiences getting into the into the chocolate business. Um, before I turn it over to our other to, to our great uh, our other presenters, I just wanted to um, sort of give a little note on the sort of the electronic format of this course. And I mean, again, this is one of the things that we really had to redo this year. So. I and the chocolatiers and my co-instructors and all the students in the course, we are currently in a Zoom call. Um, all of you out in YouTube, la YouTube land are seeing a part of that Zoom call at any one time. So, you know, you saw all of us at the very beginning. What you're going to see for the rest for about the next half hour or so is just one or two of us at a time. But all of the students are following along. We're all tasting chocolate together. You know, the students, uh, you know, at Emory and elsewhere and also all of you watching uh, via YouTube. And then at the very end, um, after the chocolate tasting, we're all going to come back together again for a, a, a question and answer period. Um, so that's all I've got for my introduction, and I will now pass it over to, to Malu Murigan, who's going to talk about some of the fundamentals of the neurobiology of flavor. Thank you so much, Sam. So, so glad to be here and really excited to give you a peek into what our class looks like. So the students, are, students and I are hoping to bring you all up to speed on some of the most interesting and important concepts that we learn together during the close of the semester. So when you think of taste, we often think of the tongue, right? So if you've ever had an opportunity to look at your tongue in the mirror, and if you haven't done it, do it after the tasting today, you might have noticed that there are these small, tiny raised bumps on your tongue. 
So these pumps called papillae, in fact, actually have the taste buds. And the taste buds in turn contain the sensory neurons that allow us to distinguish the five basic taste modalities. So these sensory neurons allow us to disting distinguish between salty foods, sweet, sour, umami, and bitter. And each neuron usually only expresses one receptor. So the way these neurons accomplish this task is by expressing specific proteins called receptors on the very tip of their membranes. So a very simple way to think about a receptor is to think of this as a lock and key me mechanism. So for in this example, for, exa uh, for instance, this sour receptor specifically is activated only by a sour molecule. And this then triggers a, chemi a chemical signal in cascade that is then you know, uh, interpreted by your brain as a percept of sourness. So this basic mechanism allows us to distinguish between these various taste modalities. Another really important concept that we addressed and tackled really early on is, uh, is, is basically debunk debunking this really popular view that specific taste modalities are in fact specialized to specific parts of your tongue. Through series of careful experiments, we in fact know that this is not true. So the next time when a self-proclaimed family member who's a foodie tells you about tasting salty at the tip of your tongue, you can actually contradict them, uh, right? So we act, in fact know that trace receptors are distributed, that for every modality, a taste modality is actually distributed throughout the course of your, throughout, the, uh, throughout your tongue. In fact, there are some differences, but those are differences in the density of the receptors. So for example, the tip and edges of your tongue in general have more taste receptors than the other parts of your tongue. Another really interesting feature is that there are uh, in fact considerable differences in the number and density of the receptors between people. So for example, some individuals known as super tasters in popular literature have a disproportionately large number of different uh, receptors in their tongue. These differences in fact are, can play a huge role in shaping our preferences for different foods and flavors. But taste is, on, uh, I mean, the tongue is only a small component of how we perceive flavor. So in addition to the fact that the tongue senses uh, the five taste uh, modalities, it also has touch receptors, which allow us to like uh, taste the texture of the food. So for example, think of like the crunch that you feel when you bite into a, uh, into a potato chip, right? But this combined with uh, olfaction, which, which, is, has, which is actually a sense that is well known to both scientists and chefs as playing a huge role in how we perceive flavor, combines with the other sensory cues for, from, your, uh, from your visual and auditory system, and it's all put together in your brain to really produce this percept of flavor. Here to tell you a little bit more about, the, about these concepts are the students of Bio 190. One of our favorite demos for this class is the Pulp Chili Crisp demo. Pulp is a local Atlanta company that specializes in fermented batteries using the farm to table method. We were fortunate enough to have a guest speaker, ex chef Nicholas Gregory, to come and speak to our class. Although they didn't invent Chili Crisp, we can safely say that they perfected the recipe. The Chili Crisp consists of three main spices Szechuan numbing peppercorns, Arbol chilies, and Gochugaru. It affects certain somatosensory receptors called pain receptors and thermal receptors. Somato somatosensory receptors are, or mouth sensing receptors are receptors that detect temperature and touch. These receptors play a role in helping us determine if uh, our food is too hot or has sharp bones. And this helps us keep our body safe from damage. Fortunately, we have evolved to enjoy eating spicy foods that activate the somatosensory receptors. We can change the aversiveness to spicy food we have at birth by learning and slowly becoming desensitized to spice. The active ingredient in spicy foods such as chili peppers is capsaicin. Capsaicin binds to TRPV1, a thermoreceptor which detects heat rather than spice. As a result, when the receptors are activated by capsaicin, the sensation we experience is linked to the perception of temperature, to the feeling of eating something near the boiling point of water. But that pain is just an illusory side effect of our confused neural receptors. Spicy foods are now enjoyed by many cultures throughout the world and have become almost an essential part of our flavor palettes. My personal favorite flavor from this course was a subtle yet savory flavor of umami. 
We had our very own umami specialist visit our class from Whiskey Bird in the heart of Atlanta. Chad Crete is the owner, founder, and head chef at Whiskey Bird, and he worked with us to showcase how he mixes and matches umami flavors to create the perfect Brussels sprouts. We started with Rosso Brussels sprouts with their specialty seasoning containing unique umami flavors, including onion powder and dill, just to name a few. We started by adding Chinese black vinegar with maple syrup for our first layer of umami. We then added takoyaki sauce, which is typically used in Japanese street food. We then added specialty whiskey bird sauce, which is Chad's spin on Japanese Kewpie mayonnaise. Finally, we added bonito flakes, which are dried and cured tuna flakes, and quality applewood smoked bacon for the perfect umami-rich Brussels sprouts. Glutamate is one of the chemical components that makes up the taste of umami that we've come to recognize in class. As an amino acid, it allows for binding with different chemical compounds that enhances the umami flavor. The method for glutamate reception is known, but the neurochemical pathways it uses are widely disputed and overall unknown. You heard about the chemical compositions of umami, but it's more common than you'd think. There are many savory foods like anchovies, prosciutto, parmigiano reggiano, sun-dried tomatoes, olives, and miso that are all naturally rich in glutamates, such as MSG, and thus triggering a strong umami flavor. One of the most important parts of deliciousness we learned about in our class was olfaction. Olfaction actually takes up about 80 to 90 percent of what constitutes flavor and smell. It's essentially our sense of smell and plays a large role of how we perceive flavor. We learned a lot about olfaction throughout the semester, but it truly came to life when we tasted ice cream from Butter and Cream. Butter and Cream is an artisan ice cream shop with locations on the square in downtown Decatur and just off the Beltline in the Old Fourth Ward. Henry Kumar, the general manager and director of operations of Butter and Cream, came to share their ice cream with us. It's made with a higher amount of butter fat than your typical ice cream, with as little air in it as possible. Less air means that the ice cream takes longer to melt. Since ice cream is essentially the only food we consume frozen, much of the aroma is suppressed until eaten and in your mouth, where olfaction is able to influence our perception of the ice cream's flavor. So we tried two types of vanilla, bourbon and Tahitian, um, but they're just two examples from a variety from across the globe. Um, vanilla is typically grown mainly near the equator to the Indian Ocean, Ocean region. Um, and the first flavor we tried bourbon is from Madagascar, and it had a full body with rummy notes. Um, this vanilla is relatively less expensive and tastes just like the one that we grew up with and love. On the other end of the spectrum, Tahitian vanilla had characteristics of sweet cherry and almond and tasted almost nothing like the bourbon vanilla. It's one of the most expensive varieties. We had Brandy Shelton come in from Just Add Honey, a local tea company. She spent a lot of time traveling all over the world, so her ability to perceive those nuanced flavors of tea is very refined. This is actually attributed to her olfaction ability, because tea is basically all smell. But we tried this one tea that was really easy to perceive because you could smell the smoke before even tasting it. It was so smoky. Um, and then other flavors were a lot harder to perceive unless your nose is as sharply refined as brandy's. Now that we've heard about how important olfaction is for our enjoyment and experience of food, what happens when you lose that ability, say as a result of COVID? Krista Diamond, a freelance journalist who wrote a piece for the New York Times, came to class to explain what her experience was like having lost her sense of taste and smell to COVID. She discussed how other modes of sensing foods, such as mouthfeel and texture, became much more important to her enjoyment of food. For example, crunchy foods quickly became her favourites due to the texture. She also told us how she could still, in a way, sense the coolness and spiciness of the food she ate and how this affected the types of food she cooked for herself. She also talked about the emotional aspect of losing her sense of olfaction after being someone who truly had a love and passion for food. Moving on, this semester we learned about the connection between memory and smell. Smell can act as a very powerful memory trigger. One good example could be how one is reminded of a swimming pool when they smell chlorine. Moreover, in class, we learned about the connection between taste, sickness, and learning. For instance, if a person ate an apple for the first time and got sick a few hours afterward, he or she will associate their sickness with the novel food he or she ate. As a result, he or she will tend to not eat it in the future. The problem here with this thinking is that there are other factors that may have caused the sickness, including the cold weather, allergies, and etc. So, 
now that you've heard from us a little bit about the concepts that we discussed in class and the important role that olfaction plays in our perception of flavor, here to offer, uh, offer us a chocolatier's perspective on how we perce perceive delicious chocolate and to tell us their path to discovering the nuances of chocolate making, we have Matt Wyant, Matt, Matt Wyant and Elian Reed, the chocolatiers and founders of Atlanta-based small chocolate artisanal store, Chocolata. Thanks, Malou. Um, and I confess, I mean, we've learned a lot uh, during this process. I confess to being somebody who used to say that different parts of the tongue had different, uh, you know, received different tastes. So uh, this has been great. I, we appreciate uh, doing this with you. I'm Matt. Uh, this is Elaine. We're founders of Chocolatel Chocolate. I'm actually a class of 2001 Emory alum. Unfortunately, Elaine went to UVA. Um, we won't hold it against her, but we both had prior careers before creating Chocolatel. I worked on political campaigns for more than a decade. Uh, during that time, Elaine worked in international aid and relief. Um, but in 2013, we were both just a little burned out and decided to quit our jobs. And we spent the better part of a year in Costa Rica. And we didn't know anything about chocolate when we went down. It wasn't our intention to get into chocolate. Uh, but while we were there, we met farmers who were growing cacao and making chocolate with that cacao. And we fell in love with the taste of that chocolate and then the process of making it. And we decided to come back to Atlanta and hopefully introduce the city to that same type of dark chocolate that we ate every day there in Costa Rica. So we're going to taste some chocolate in just a few minutes, but I um, wanted to first tell you a little bit about where chocolate comes from. Uh, first of all, our name Chocolatl is the original Nahuatl word spoken by Aztecs and Mayans for the drink that was the basis for what we now know as chocolate. Uh, so they would mix ground and roasted cacao beans with water, cornmeal, and spices to create a bitter but a fortifying drink called chocolatl. And chocol means bitter and atl means water. So it was bitter water. And we love how the name was for us was kind of a bridge between the place where cacao is grown and then where we make it, it has the ATL at the end of the name, if you haven't noticed, uh, the place where we make it into chocolate uh, here in Atlanta. So most people, uh, I think, don't know that chocolate is actually made from the seed of a fruit. And growing up, uh, I at one point went with my family to the Hershey factory in Pennsylvania. And Having been there, I think I just kind of thought chocolate was this sort of man-made concoction that was cooked up in these big stainless steel vats. And when we were in Costa Rica, as Matt mentioned, and saw the process of chocolate being made from seeds, I was totally blown away. And so I think before we start talking about how we make chocolate, we'll talk a little bit about what it is, starting with the word cacao or cocoa. Um, for a lot of people who wonder, there's actually not really a lot of difference between the words cacao and cocoa. You can essentially use them interchangeably. Um, Theobroma cacao is the name of the tropical tree that produces fruit, also called cacao. And the fruit, uh, the cacao fruit have seeds in them, again, confusingly, also called cacao. And it's the cacao seeds that we use to make chocolate. Um, in this photo, you can see there's a pile of cacao pods that were just harvested from one of the farms that we work with in Peru. And you can see that the farmer is growing different varieties of cacao, uh, which is indicated by the different colors and sizes and shapes of the pods. And here again in this photo, you can see the cacao pods grouped by variety. Again, different varieties can be identified by their color and their shape or their size. Um, and from my perspective, more importantly, um, than just being able to, to identify the, the different pods visually, the genetically different types of cacao, when they're handled carefully by both the farmer and the chocolate maker, will actually produce chocolate that has its own inherently unique flavor. Um, it's essentially the same concept as how different wine grapes produce different types of wine, um, or why a Granny Smith apple uh, tastes totally different from a Red Delicious apple. One of the, in this photo, you can see one of the weird things about Theobroma cacao is that the fruit pods, if you look closely, actually grow straight off the trunks of the trees instead of at the ends of the branches, like most fruit trees. And the colors here from the different trees tell you um, that there are different varieties that this particular farmer is growing. 
And having a high level of biodiversity achieves three really important things, which is why I wanted to spend a little time talking about it. Um, one, biodiversity uh, just makes for healthier rainforests and healthier jungles that the cacao is growing in. Um, secondly, having a diversity uh, in genetics will also make for a stronger harvest for the farmer. And then for the sake of the chocolate lover, it will also make uh, many more different types of interesting uh, variations in chocolate flavor. And so um, here we are, uh, some photos of Matt and I uh, taking a, a trip down to meet with some of our partners. These photos are all from Peru. Um, and while a very tiny amount of cacao will actually grow in the wild and, and be harvested, the vast majority of the world's cacao gets planted and tended and harvested by farmers, by people. And most of the cacao farmers around the world are getting commodity pricing for their cacao. So think in terms of just a couple of dollars a day. Um, we work, however, directly with small scale farmers and farmer cooperatives in Peru, Nicaragua, Uganda, and Tanzania. Those are our current origins. And we source our cacao from uh, these farmers and farmer cooperatives, and we pay 65 to 75% above commodity and fair trade pricing. Um, and we do this because we, we understand, uh, or at least from our perspective, trading directly with the farmers and farmer cooperatives you know, really allows us to build long-term relationships that are transparent, they're mutually beneficial, um, and where essentially we recognize each other as human beings in, uh, in, a, in a relationship with each other, not just a transaction. And, you know, I, I bring all this up because chocolate for us has always been about people. So we orient our business practices and decisions around the question of, are we serving people? By developing long-term relationships with farmers, we can be a source of reliable steady income that they can count on and they can be a source of reliable fine quality goods that we can count on. And by choosing to work with small scale farmers, we're also getting that wider diversity of fine cacao that I was mentioning before um, that we can turn into a much uh, more interesting and, and sort of nuanced spectrum of flavors in our chocolate. Um, as I mentioned, here we are in Peru. Um, we're obviously learning from and spending time with some of the growers that we work with. And in the photo on the right, um, we're sharing some chocolate bars with one of the producers that uh, grows cacao that goes into these bars. Um, they were both award-winning bars from the year previous. Uh, one was a national award, one was an international award. So it was a real treat to be able to go and, and share kind of the result of the labor with the farmers. And we're going to try some of that chocolate in just a minute. Some of the same chocolate that was there in that photo. Um, but first, we're going to now just talk quickly about how you turn a fruit into chocolate. And one thing I just want to also note is that this is actually a cacao tree behind us here that we've uh, been growing from uh, seed from some uh, pods we brought back from Peru. Um, so the first thing is that you start again with a cacao pod. And you start with what's inside a cacao pod. And what we call cocoa beans are actually the seeds of this fruit. And the seeds you can see here are covered in a fruit pulp. Um, then uh, after the farmers harvest the pods, they remove the pulp along with the seeds and begin a fermentation process. So the pulp is actually really important because it's what provides the sugars, which then feed the microbes that power the fermentation. And fermentation has a really big impact on the flavor of chocolate. Fermentation process uh, greatly reduces the astringency of chocolate. And you may not think of chocolate uh, that you've had in the past as being, uh, you know, having like natural fruit notes to it. But as I hope that you'll find when we do our chocolate tasting, a uh, good cacao um, that's, that's well made uh, can have real fruit notes in the chocolate itself. And these are developed during the fermentation process. And so once the seeds have been fermented, uh, they can also, they can no longer germinate, meaning they can no longer sprout and grow a new cacao tree because we can't make chocolate uh, with a tree. Um, so uh, we've also, I think the next slide, we've got uh, some examples. These are fermentation boxes uh, that are at a farm in, in uh, Pangoa, Peru. Uh, where we've been working for several years. Uh, so the, the, farmer, the farmers will put their beans into these fermentation boxes. 
The fermentation process then typically takes five to 10 days. And then the beans, uh, during that process, the beans are turned over from one box to the next every day or so. Then after fermentation, the beans are laid out to dry. And then this is another process that takes typically 10 to 14 days, kind of depends on the weather a little bit. And also really manually labor and step uh, in the process um, because the beans have to be raked uh, several times a day. And then once the beans are dried, they're inspected, they're graded, they're bagged up, and they're shipped to us uh, then to be made into chocolate. So now from here on, everything happens in our little factory here in Atlanta. Now, once we receive the beans, uh, we hand sort them, we pick out any flat, inferior, or damaged beans. Uh, sometimes there's even debris like pebbles that may have made their way into the cacao sacks that we pick out. And then um, this is kind of a big step. We roast the beans. And so this is the first step where we as chocolate makers can really make an impact on the finished flavor of the chocolate. So similar to roasting coffee beans, roasting cacao is a careful process and we'll go through dozens of roast profiles to find what we think is, you know, kind of our preferred roasting time and temperature for each type of cacao. So generally speaking, a light roast will retain some of those fruity flavors that develop during the fermentation process. A dark roast um, can create more caramelized flavors. Um, and roasting cacao for chocolate is really the art of developing the flavor, kind of transforming it from something that might be more acidic and sour to something that tastes more like what we kind of think of as chocolate. So doing that without losing the flavor of each bean. So now we're going to combine what Matt just was talking about with roasting with Malu's olfactory lesson from a few minutes ago. We're going to do two quick experiments. Um, the first one is to see if we can smell the difference between cacao that has been roasted um, and cacao that hasn't and see if our brains tell us which type we'd prefer to eat. Um, the second experiment is to see if smell really does matter all that much when you're tasting food. Um, so the first thing you want to do, you have two bags um, that have silver tape on them. If you haven't already, go ahead and open those up. In one bag, you'll have two raw cacao beans. So these are beans that have been fermented and dried but have not been roasted. And the second pouch has roasted cacao nibs. And as Matt said before, the nibs are the basically the crushed pieces of roasted cacao bean after they've been shelled. So I'll let you guys get those out. <laughs> okay, so um, the first thing uh, for the first experiment, go ahead and take one of the raw beans um, and see if you can, well, you can smell it first. You might get a little bit of aromas um, coming out of it, uh, but if you can kind of twist and break your cacao, your cacao seed, um, you'll be able to kind of get more of those aromas. Some of these cacao seeds are hard to break because they haven't been roasted. Um, so if you're extra adventurous, you could bite into one and, and break it that way. Okay, so once, is, if everyone's got their raw bean that they have managed to break or bite, <laughs> go ahead and take a whiff of it. See what kind of flavors you might be detecting in the aroma. And then you're gonna go ahead and set the beans down a little bit, a little bit uh, flaky in your hands. Yep, and then take a whiff of the cacao nibs. And um, I guess consider if there's something different that you're tasting. I think that uh, in most cases, uh, what you might have smelled from the raw bean was some more sour, acidic flavors. Um, and with the cacao nibs, if we know if we roasted them right, <laughs> um, they should smell a little bit more like what you would expect uh, chocolate to smell like. Um, so that would be kind of the culinary side of flavor. If you preferred the smell of the nibs over the smell of the raw bean, I think that would probably touch into the neuroscience side of flavor. Now for the second experiment um, to see just how much our olfactory system plays into our sense of flavor, go ahead and pinch your nose. I'm gonna have Matt be my demonstrator. Pinch your nose, grab um, a pinch of the roasted cacao nibs. They're not the bean, but the roasted nibs. Pop them in your mouth and start chewing while your nose is still plugged. Now you might be able to detect some amount of flavor 
I think that uh, Matt wants me to hurry up. Um, you might also be able to kind of get some more of the sensation of acidity in your mouth. Now, unplug your nose and see if there are any other flavors that you might be picking up now that you can smell. So for me, it definitely goes from um, a little bit uh, like kind of fruity-ish. Um, and then when I open my nose, I get the, the whiff of like what you would normally think of as like the chocolate aroma that you're we're kind of used to. So I think it turns out um, that it is not the tongue, uh, but the olfactory senses. I'm back to Mel. All right. So um, just a few more minutes and then we're going to eat uh, the rest of the chocolate. But uh, after we roast the beans, then we crack them and we remove the husk that um, they come in. And then they go into our stone grinders. We've got these big stone grinders and they grind in there for 24 hours a day for three to four days. And as they're grinding, the cocoa butter, cocoa butter comes from cacao beans uh, and it's contained inside the bean. And as they're grinding, uh, that releases and it becomes liquid chocolate. And we add an organic cane sugar to the grinders during that time. Uh, and those are the only two ingredients that go into our single origin chocolate bar. So it's just cacao and cane sugar and that's it. So um, after this time in the grinder, uh, we mold the bars. We add any toppings that we might use uh, for flavor inclusions at this point. So some, you know, almonds, sea salt and things like that would be sprinkled on the back of the bar. And then finally, we hand wrap the bars and they go out on our shelves at our factory store and where they get shipped to our online customers or wholesale partners. If you're in Atlanta, you can actually see our whole chocolate making process at our micro factory in Crog Street Market. We, it's all kind of visible to the public and you can kind of see the whole process. And when we roast beans, the whole market smells like brownies, which is nice. Um, so we also supply chocolate to other retailers, coffee shops, restaurants, ice cream shops, other food businesses, both in Atlanta and, and nationally. Okay, um, so now, thank you, uh, Matt and Elaine. So now we're going to hear a little bit more about neuroscience, and then we're going to get to eat uh, the, the, the rest of the chocolate that you all have in front of you. Um, so I am now going to introduce our next presenter, uh, who is Maha Rashid. Maha is a graduate student in the Emory Neuroscience PhD program. Um, I just want to say one of the things that I think has made this, this food and neuroscience class really successful over the years is how much involvement there's been uh, from Emory Neuroscience graduate students. So every year uh, we or I've taught this class, there's been a co-instructor who, who has been a grad student and they really you know, bring fantastic stuff to this class. So I will now uh, uh, turn it over to Maha. We will take it away. Cool, thanks so much, Sam. So now that you've heard it from Matt and Elaine about the process of chocolate making, we're gonna talk about a little bit about the neuroscience of chocolate. So chocolate is inherently rewarding. It's why you're all here. You find something inherently peaceful, tasty, and comforting in chocolate. And there's a lot of neuroscience to back that up. The brain mechanisms involved in reward, motivation, satiety, are all activated when you eat chocolate. But what's happening on your tongue when you taste chocolate? To harken back to what Malu mentioned earlier, taste cells in your taste buds on your tongue respond to specific taste modalities such as salt, sweet, sour, umami, and bitter. These different taste modalities have distinct pathways when they arrive in the brain region involved in taste to create the percept of flavor. Now, with any food, the combination of salty, sweet, sour, and bitter is what makes our favorite foods our favorite foods. Chocolate isn't any different. Salty, sweet, bitter, sour can work together to create our favorite chocolate flavors. These different flavors can work together to suppress or enhance each modality to create a unique tasting experience. Now to understand these mechanisms more, I'm gonna walk you through how these mechanisms work together in the different chocolate bars you'll be tasting right after this presentation. So tonight you'll be tasting a total of five different chocolate bars. The first one I wanna talk about is the 85% Peru. Now only 15% of the chocolate bar is cane sugar as Matt and Elaine mentioned. So it's more bitter than it is sweet. The bitter molecules in the chocolate are binding to bitter receptors, creating a mostly bitter percept. 
Then after the 85%, you'll be tasting a 70% for rhubarb, which is the exact same as the 85%, except there's double the amount of cane sugar present in the chocolate bar. So therefore you have the same amount of bitter molecules present, but you have a higher number of sugar molecules. This plays into the concept of sweetness suppressing bitterness in your chocolate. The more sweet receptors are activated, thus suppressing the bitter taste, resulting in a generally sweeter chocolate bar. So then I wanna talk about the 70% Nicaragua chocolate that you're gonna taste tonight. Now, similar to the Peru, the 70% Peru, there will be an interaction of sweet and bitter. So it'll be a bitter bar with hints of sweet. You then will be tasting a 70% Nicaragua bar, but this time with added sea salt. So although this bar has the same amount of cacao and cane sugar, it might surprisingly taste sweeter, even with the addition of sea salt. Although some of the scientific details are still being worked out, it's thought that the presence of salt increases the ability of some sweet receptors uh, to bind sweet molecules, over, overall increasing our percept of sweetness. Chefs know and exploit this flavor combination really, really well. For example, when adding a pinch of salt to baked goods to enhance sweetness, but also adding a pinch of salt to a cup of coffee in the morning to suppress bitterness. Therefore, act, salt should act to both enhance the sweetness and suppress the bitterness of the Nicaragua chocolate bar with sea salt, resulting in an overall sweeter experience. Now, remember that next time you bite into your favorite chocolate, that there's so many different actors at play. From the interactions of the different tastes that we've highlighted tonight to your sense of smell and the texture of the chocolate and the way the chocolate looks and sounds. So take that into account when you take when you taste the chocolate tonight. And although we've only touched the surface of the neuroscience of chocolate, we hope you've gained a greater appreciation for what happens when you taste chocolate. Now for the part you've all been waiting for. Next, we're going to do the chocolate tasting. But before we do that, I'm gonna ask you all to go grab a glass of room temperature water. And also on the slide, we have a poll everywhere that you can participate in from the YouTube. And so a link will be sent in the YouTube. If you wanna participate mobily, you can text that code to that number. But while you're getting your room temperature water, listen to some jazz music from our talented students. But you know what else goes great with food, Kristen? Jazz? That's a great point. That's a great point. Hit it, Jordan. <laughs> was amazing. So now to really walk us through the tasting, let's welcome Matt and Lynn. First off, I want to say that music was amazing. That was the nicest kind of surprise of my day. Like, thank you to the students that are so talented and willing to do that. 
Um, before we start, I know a lot of us have said we're about to start, we're about to start. One more thing. Um, I want to give you a couple of general tips on tasting chocolate. Um, the first thing is uh, you're going to be breaking each of those chocolate squares into a bite-sized piece. Um, so those are pretty large. We definitely don't expect you to have one whole piece in the first bite. When you break it, listen for the snap. Um, the sound of a good crisp snap is a sign that you have a, a well-tempered chocolate bar. Secondly, you're going to cup the chocolate in your hand and bring the chocolate up to your nose for a deep inhale to get your olfactory senses ready. Interestingly, chocolate does not always taste exactly like what the first aromas you smell are. You're then going to let the chocolate rest on your tongue, letting it start to melt so that the flavors caught in the chocolate start to hit your olfactory senses. And once it's started to soften, go ahead and bite into the chocolate and take a few um, slow bites before swallowing it. And that will help um, kind of give some more time for some of the more subtle or nuanced flavors to really come out. And going slow through this process and breathing while you're tasting will also help you pick out some more of those subtle flavors. Um, if you can help it, try to avoid chewing the chocolate with your back teeth whenever you're tasting more than one kind of chocolate because chocolate just tends to get stuck back there and, and will influence the flavor of the other chocolates. Um, and then finally, as Maha asked all of you guys to go get some room temperature water, um, room temp water or even some white bread uh, can be really helpful in between chocolate bites. It helps to just kind of clean your palate. Um, cold drinks, kind of unsurprisingly, uh, will make, your, uh, make it a little bit harder for your tongue to melt the chocolate. Okay, so now that we've gone over kind of the, the, the basics, um, if everyone has got their tasting key um, out, as uh, I think as Maha had said, the um, chocolate is color coded. So if you haven't already done this, um, you can kind of match the chocolate with the, uh, the colored tape with the cacao pod that it corresponds with. And just like how a dinner is coursed, uh, starting with salad and ending with dessert, we're also gonna start with our most bitter chocolate and then progress down to our sweetest chocolate. The first three chocolates that you have, the purple, red, and green, are all made with just two ingredients, so just cacao and cane sugar. The percent there tells you what um, percent of the chocolate by weight is uh, made up of the cacao, and in the, that case, the remainder is uh, the quantity of sugar that's in the cacao, uh, I'm sorry, that's in the chocolate. Um, the fourth, uh, chocolate, the yellow one, um, is also just cacao and cane sugar, but as Maha mentioned earlier, there's going to be some sea salt sprinkled on the back, so we'll see what kind of effect that might have. And then finally, the 60% Ugandan cacao, the blue bar, um, is made with cacao, cane sugar, uh, coconut milk, and then we added some sea salt and roasted nibs on the back. And then um, hopefully when we get to that one, you'll be able to tell us how well we might have combined salty, sweet, and bitter. All right, okay, so for the first chocolate, um, the purple one, this is the 85% chocolate, 85% dark Peruvian chocolate. Go ahead and break it. And remember to kind of cup it in your hand and give it a deep inhale. And when you're ready, go ahead and set the chocolate um, right on your tongue. And it is okay if you start chewing right away, but if you can kind of help it, try to let it start to soften a little bit on your tongue before you start chewing. And I, I just want to mention something, although I probably should not have a mouthful of chocolate when I'm breaking into the, the, the broadcast here. Um, so don't forget, the students are all, the students in Biology 190 are all on this call too. Um, so one of the challenges of doing this by Zoom is uh, we want to be able to give Elaine feedback. Um, all of you in YouTube land are going to be able to use the poll everywhere thing in just a couple of minutes. But I want to invite the students in the class um, to share their reactions and, uh, you know, when, when, when Elaine asks for them, let's say. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Um, so hopefully uh, you've had some time for that chocolate to really kind of hit all, uh, get all up in there <laughs> in your olfactory senses, in your mouth. Um, and uh, uh, I want you to think about whether or not this chocolate tasted more bitter or less bitter than you might have expected. Um, what you can do also is to take a look at the, uh, the center of that tasting ring. Um, and uh, the center categories will kind of give you an idea of um, 
words that might help kind of jog your thoughts on what flavors you might be tasting. Um, so you might be tasting fruity notes or earthy or nutty notes. Um, once you have kind of determined which of the categories in that inner circle resonate with you, you can go out to the middle circle where there's slightly more um, descriptive terms. Um, and then finally that outer circle has kind of the most descriptive terms. Um, and uh, as you're tasting, this would be a great time if people want to include in the in the poll or for the students to, to let us know what flavors they're tasting. I'm getting oh, wow. a bit, I'm getting a bit of sourness, kind of like citrusy. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a, it looks like a bitter is definitely one of the dominant um, responses. Um, some people it got the amount of bitterness they were expecting. Um, also sour and fruity. Yeah. yeah. A little like raspberry. Yeah. Sort of. yeah. Yeah. And so there are definitely no right or wrong answers. Taste is obviously highly subjective. Um, the wheel that we were looking at a few moments ago is, is from the website, The Sea Spot. And it's just basically a helpful tool um, if it helps to kind of put your finger on the word um, of what flavor you might be tasting. Um, and at so at 85% chocolate, 85% uh, cacao, most people would automatically assume that this is going to be a bitter bar. Um, but as we're asking in this poll, um, I'm definitely curious to see if people agree that it's bitter or if they might consider it sour. Well, it's about 50-50 almost. Yeah, it definitely wasn't as bitter as I was expecting it to be with 85%. Um, and I definitely got like the tartness. A lot of people are saying the tartness and the sour comes through. Yeah. Yep. I'm really getting notes of coffee and almond skin. Yeah. Nice. So it seems like maybe a little bit of astringency um, or a little bit of a, other flavors kind of balancing out or, or in participating with that, that freeness. All right, so it looks like, I, I guess, um, you know, kind of moving on, it, it looks like sour might be pulling ahead a little bit at 53%. Um, but yeah, I think that one of the pieces of feedback that we frequently get from customers is that they're expecting actually the bar to be a lot more bitter than it was. It certainly is bitter and be sour, um, but I think people are surprised um, that it's not more bitter. Um, so we're going to go ahead to the next bar, uh, and I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So the chocolate that we're doing next is the red chocolate. It is our 70% Peruvian cacao. It is, as Maha said earlier, it's ex the two exact same ingredients, only in this case we have twice as much sugar. So there's 30% sugar in this chocolate versus 15. So remember, if you uh, have started already, go ahead and break the bar, um, smell it if you'd like, and then go ahead and set it on your tongue. And I guess I would ask you to consider what flavors you might be picking up. Again, referring to this tasting wheel might be helpful um, if you want to look at some of the, the flavor profiles that you might be picking up. But again, you might be picking up completely different pro profiles. So it's not like the answer has to be on that wheel. And I'd also wonder how you all think uh, this bar might be uh, similar or different from the last cacao. Does it taste uh, primarily um, this significantly the same or does it feel pretty different? And then secondarily, if you find yourself preferring the 85% or the 70%. I think this bar is a lot less sour um, and I can also get a lot more nutty notes with it. I think for like a lot of people, um, they perceive chocolate as like when they're eating like not as high quality chocolate, it is a very uniform flavor. And it's something that is like either sweet with milk chocolate or just straight bitter with dark chocolate. And they don't really think about like the different notes and stuff. So um, I don't know. Personally, I like the 85 just if I don't think about it as like the standard chocolate. Yeah, that's, that's great feedback. I love that. Um, and with the, the different flavors, as you mentioned, I think also tie into what we were talking earlier about biodiversity and then the amount of influence that the cacao farmers and the, the, and the chocolate makers have on the, the um, ultimate flavor of the cacao. 
Um, so before we go into the third copy, uh, the third chocolate, um, I want to segue back into a super short biodiversity lesson. And the, the secret purpose to this also is to give yourselves, give your mouths a little bit of a rest before we transition over to the next chocolate. Um, so this graph is, uh, was created by uh, Dr. Juan Motamayor. He's a plant molecular biologist who worked with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, and he was mapping the different genetic clusters of native cacaos found just in the upper Amazon region of Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, Brazil, a little bit of Central America. Um, as of right now, there are a minimum of 14 genetically different uh, cacaos that have been identified and categorized. Um, and my assumption is that as we speak, more and more are being uh, identified and categorized. And, uh, you know, I think it's really important that as consumers, we learn a little bit about the different varieties or even just simply that there are different varieties um, so that we can create and market demand for biodiversity in cacao and chocolate and not get stuck with a monoculture crop, um, which is what happens to so much of uh, the crops in our agriculture. And touching back to what Madison was just saying, um, to, to be able to, to provide chocolate that doesn't all taste the same. Um, so we have talked about how genetic varieties impact flavor, where cacao grows does also, and factors like um, soil, uh, the growing climate, um, usually referred to as terroir, uh, can also play an, a, a part in how chocolate from different areas will taste differently. And now I will transition back into the chocolate tasting. Hopefully you all have had a chance to uh, kind of get a fresh mouth. The third chocolate we're trying uh, is also a 70% dark chocolate. So the composition of the Nicaraguan bar, the green chocolate, is precisely the same as the composition of the red chocolate, the Peruvian chocolate. Um, the only difference is that uh, instead of cacao grown in, uh, in Peru, this cacao is uh, from the highlands of Nicaragua. So go ahead, as we've been doing, break ahead, break open the chocolate give it a big, a good smell, and then place it on your tongue. And I would ask you all to start thinking about how different this chocolate might taste from the 70% Peruvian cacao that we just had, or does it taste mostly the same? And, uh, you know, is this one a little more fruity, a little more earthy, floral? Are there other flavors that you're detecting? Uh, I think here there's an um, opportunity also to kind of enter in some of the flavor notes that you might be detecting. I know a lot of people um, in the YouTube chat section were saying that the last one tasted a bit like raisins and there was like raisinette like tones to it. This one, I definitely get less of the fruit, less of the tart, and more of like the nutty and like warm flavors. That's a great uh, point. And Peruvian cacao is actually known for that kind of raisiny, kind of dark fruity flavor. So good job, everybody. And these are great notes. I love this. I've got, we've got buttery, floral, mushroom, cheesy, lemon. Um, it's all really, really good notes, you guys. So one thing that's interesting to note here is that because, um, as I said before, the, the amount of sugar and cacao in this chocolate and the one that you just tasted um, is exactly the same. Whatever difference you're tasting in these two chocolates is perceived by your olfactory system. So going back to the science side of it, the genetic differences in the two cacaos and how they were handled and processed and turned into chocolate by us creates kind of Peruvian and Nicaraguan aromas that tell your brain that these are two very different flavors. I'm really tasting brown butter and caramel with this one. Yeah, yeah me too. I love that, yep. Yeah, these are great. All right, so we are gonna go to the fourth chocolate. Um, so this one is the yellow chocolate. It is actually the exact same chocolate that you just had, the 70% Nicaragua, only this time we sprinkled sea salt on the back. <coughs> now, uh, we hand sprinkled the sea salt, so it's not like a totally even distribution. So when you pick this one up and, and get ready to, to put it in your mouth, um, look at it, get like a particularly salty side um, and place the salt side on your tongue. Uh, 
And as that chocolate is starting to melt and you're chewing it and you're perceiving different flavors, I'd be curious to know if you feel that the 70% chocolate with the sea salt tastes sweeter or more bitter or has no substantial difference. To me, this one tastes sweeter. Um, and I don't know why, because it's a bit weird with the salt, but yeah, it definitely tastes sweeter. I know that salt brings out flavor and I think um, that's what's happening here where the salt's bringing out the sweetness in the chocolate and um, slightly playing down the bitter a bit. And this ties really nicely back into what Maha was talking about earlier about how, you know, this relationship between salt and um, and sweetness is something that chefs understand really, really, really well. And neuroscientists are only sort of starting to get a handle on it. So remember Maha was talking about this idea that salt in your mouth will sort of modify the activity of sweet receptor cells. Um, so that's, that's uh, I don't know, it's a nice point of connection between sort of deliciousness is understood by chefs and deliciousness is understood by neuroscientists. And also kind of adding to Sam, I think it acts at different levels. So there are modifications that happen at the level of your receptor or your tongue. But there are also like effects in the brain uh, where these salt pathways are, you know, sort of enhancing sugar responses. So, which, which is really cool. And I'll go ahead and say, so it looks like the poll right now, we've got about 79% of folks saying that it tastes sweeter, 4% bitter, 17% no difference. And trusting in the science of this, um, what I'm going to go ahead and say is, again, since we hand sprinkled the salt on the back, I think some people probably got a bit more of a heavy sprinkling and some people might have gotten less of a sprinkling of salt. So we'll uh, kind of take that on our shoulders. All right, now finally, chocolate as dessert. Um, so if you are more of a milk chocolate person, I want to first thank you for <laughs> kind of working with us uh, on those last four very dark chocolates. Um, and hopefully this next chocolate is going to be a reward. Um, so this chocolate is a 60% uh, coconut milk chocolate made of 60% Ugandan cacao, 27% sugar. So it actually has slightly less sugar than the last uh, three bars that you had four bars, um, and then 13% coconut milk. And then we went ahead and sprinkled um, some bitter roasted nibs as well as sea salt on the backs of these. So we're really mixing everything we just talked about here in this bar, both the sweetness uh, from the sugar, the coconut milk itself has some sweetness to it, then the sea salt, and then the nibs adding a little bit of bitterness actually to play with the sea salt and the extra sweetness. Yeah, so as you taste this chocolate, as this question lays out, we'd be curious to know what your immediate reactions are. Pleasure, distaste, confusion, balance. <laughs> and as Matt said, uh, kind of wanting to incorporate all of these different triggers, um, you know, I guess we'd be curious to see whether you feel that the bitterness, sweetness, and saltiness work together cohesively and balance each other out, um, or if you feel an overwhelming taste of sweet or salt or bitter. And we're already getting a lot of great uh, responses. Way layered, I love that. When I was doing the smelling technique you guys told us about, I definitely smelled the coconut before tasting it. And then whenever I did taste it, I got the coconut. And I feel like the uh, roasted nibs do like like uh, play it out. And there's a good combination as you continue to eat the chocolate. The coconut flavor was a lot stronger than I was expecting it to. Like it's pretty balanced with the chocolate, but I wasn't expecting it to like be so strong with it. I think my favorite reaction so far is godly. That's uh, that's good. <laughs> I'll take that. Has that ever come up in any of your previous tastings? But... I think that's the first, but yeah. Where, where does it go on the wheel also? The oh, godly. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's a satellite around the wheel. <laughs> Um, so this bar actually is, uh, it's, it's always been our most popular uh, customer sort of favorite. Um, the bar is called Kiss Mermaids. Um, it's got kind of a weird name. I'll just say that the name is a reference to my favorite Pixies song, if any of you are 
old enough to know the Pixies. <laughs> Sam's old enough. <laughs> I was one here. Um, and I guess at this point, we'll leave it for any questions. Yeah, so let's do this. Um, let's go back to, to sort of gallery gallery mode here so that we can at least see everybody, um, hopefully, on this call. So this is um, this where we're going to. So this is where we're going to open it up to questions, both from folks in the class and then also a couple of people of the students in the class have been monitoring the YouTube chat. So I know we've got some um, questions saved up from there. Um, so I guess actually let's start if, if any students, if you have any of your own questions, we can start with you all and then maybe we'll jump over to a couple of them um, from the YouTube chat. Oh, I have a question. So when you're making like the chocolates, are you using like a multiple different like variety of like the different like breed like breeds of it, or are you doing like a specific like combination in each chocolate bar? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, <coughs> excuse me, we have what we call our single origin bars. So those are similar to like the Peru that we tried, the Nicaragua that it's they're dark chocolate bars and the only difference is in the variety of the cacao and so you know one, or, well i should say the origin of the cacao so you know the chocolate from peru versus the chocolate from nicaragua now any um any any place that we're sourcing from within that uh region there's going to be different genetic varieties so it's not like we just it's not like it's just like one pure genetic strain Cacao is really promiscuous. There's a lot of, so we saw those 14 different families of cacao earlier. If you were to, we, and we've done genetic sampling actually, and when we've taken trips down and taken samples and things, you'll find, uh, you know, several different families represented from, from you know, a, a cutting from one tree or something like that. So, so uh, it's not a clean and simple thing. And then when we are, uh, but you do get really unique flavors, I think, as we saw between the different origins. And so then what we're making our what we call our flavor inclusion bars, which would be like, for example, the Kiss Mermaids bar that we had. Um, we try to, we pick uh, the origin based on the flavor that we're trying to develop. So like with Kiss Mermaids, we use our Ugandan cacao, cacao which has, it doesn't have a lot of fruit notes that, that would kind of clash with like the coconut milk and the, you know, what we were trying to do with that bar. It's much more of like a cocoa-y kind of flavor a little bit of caramel -y. Um, We do a almond and sea salt bar, and that one we use our Peruvian cacao because we want those fruit notes to interact with the almonds and the sea salt. It almost creates kind of like a PB&J kind of effect with the, with the bar. So we definitely, uh, for each bar that we do, kind of uh, make that you know, distinction. Um, I, I can actually do one from the chat. So my my, my colleague Astrid Prin, our colleague Astrid Prins in the uh, in the department and also in the YouTube chat, um, asked about the relationship between olf what, what we're calling olfactants and tastants. So in terms of making up you know the flavor or the character of a bar, what's the relationship between the things you sense on your tongue with taste and the things that you sense through through smell, through olfaction in your nose? And I I love this question. This really sort of gets to the heart, I think, of the, the, the neuroscience of chocolate which is that it's almost all smell, essentially. So, you know, we tasted, I, I don't have my notes in front of me, but we tasted, I think it was the Peru and the Nicaragua that had the same fraction of sugar, but had this incredibly different flavor that we all picked up on. So what that means, remember your tongue, you can only taste the five basic tastes. You can only taste sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Um, and so from the perspective of your tongue, those two are identical chocolate bars. If you held, we probably should have done this, or you can go back and do it now if you want an excuse to eat more chocolate, which you probably do. Um, hold your nose. You probably can't, you can probably taste a little bit of sweet, maybe a tiny bit of bitterness, but they're going to taste identical if your nose is closed. Um, but then once you, you know, let go of your nose and get the olfactory sense from these two different, you know, varietals of chocolate, that's when you notice that it tastes totally different. So Elaine was talking about this concept of terroir, the idea that, you know, there's something incredibly local and specific about, you know, the flavor of, say, a cacao, you know, a cacao from one part of South America versus another. The thing, and, you know, same thing is true of what people say the same things about wine, et cetera. 
it's all smell. It's all olfaction. These things all taste more or less exactly the same. But, you know, all of, and, you know, everything that you were all, you know, people were saying, you know, giving us these wonderful adjectives for in the, the poll, that's all the olfactory component. That's all you're, that's all you're talking about. I mean, the, the sugar taste difference is really interesting, but almost everything that we talk about that makes a particular chocolate special is based on smell. So great question, Astrid. Thank you for asking. Hey, Jordan, you want to you wanna go next? Yeah, I had a question. Um, you talked about like going to Costa Rica and kind of like learning the chocolate making process from them. Um, I was wondering if there's anything that you like consciously like try to do different or if you like stay true to that. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think in going to Costa Rica, one of the things that was really eye-opening for me personally was seeing the chocolate being made in a uh on on a hillside in a little very small space that was like three walled open aired you know i thought you had to have like a huge chocolate factory <laughs> and so it was this realization i mean i didn't know how chocolate was made before then so it was this realization that this was um something that was doable and we're basically making our chocolate the exact same way that it was made um at the places that we we visited when we were there um and i would say i think the reason why we've tried to stick with that process um is because uh basically uh it by making chocolate the way we're making it, starting with the whole cacao bean, roasting it, we have a lot of input in what the final flavor is going to be. So we can vary it through our roast profile or the, the cacao that we use. We could even uh, play around with combining beans like one of um, one of y'all was talking about. And uh, But in doing that, we are um, stripping away or just not even using a lot of the um, ingredients that you would typically see in a bar of chocolate. So if you were to kind of imagine a Hershey bar and kind of like think about what that ingredient box might look like on the back of it, you're probably gonna see 20 or so ingredients listed. Um, and in the case of our chocolate, it's usually only two ingredients unless we add flavor ingredients to it. And for us, that allows us to um, kind of just create chocolate that, that just tastes more interesting and kind of honors the differences that are inherent in the cacao. Thank you. Great, uh, Kristen. Okay, so I've got a question coming from Melissa on the YouTube, and she asks, how do we pair chocolates to food, and does your business do pair tastings? We do, we, uh, we do usually um, special requests. It's something that we don't um, have kind of offered generally, but if you're interested in talking about a pairing, I would suggest that you go to, I believe in the, the form that you've got has our... Um, uh, email address on it, sales at chocolatlechocolate.com. And if you wanted to send a quick email there, we can talk a little bit more specifically about um, pairings. I would say generally it's fun to pair chocolate with other things, whether it's food, whether it's beverages. Um, it's a really fun process. Um, it is different from doing a chocolate tasting where what you're trying to kind of really understand is the subtle differences in the chocolate you're tasting. Um, so it's a different format and it's a totally different event. Um, but yeah, definitely send us an email. But we have done, we've done chocolate and, and wine. We've done chocolate and beer. We've done chocolate and uh, mezcal, which was fun. Um, and we've also done a uh, chocolate themed dinner. I mean, we actually didn't do this, but for our, our five-year company anniversary, we had a chocolate themed dinner where each dish had a different whether it was using the cacao fruit or nibs or chocolate in the dessert uh, kind of throughout the whole like five courses. So that was really good. I have a question from um, Astrid in the chat. Um, have taste preferences for chocolate changed over time with regard to sourness, bitterness, sweetness, and maybe saltiness added? Do you want to do like a 20 second history of... Uh... Well, I was just going to say, I think what we can probably give is just um, anecdotal evidence, um, but we're seeing that there is more and more demand for dark chocolate. So starting at 70% and higher, how much of that is preference versus how much of that is people hearing that dark chocolate 70% or higher is good for your heart, it's good for your brain. 
Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much people are choosing the darker chocolates for flavor or for health reasons, but there is definitely a very, very sharp increase in interest globally around dark chocolate. Um, and then as far as the sour chocolates go, I think what we really enjoy kind of seeing is with our customers, particularly the customers that come to our retail store when it's open and you know, <laughs> there are a lot of people there, um, is getting immediate feedback. Um, and I think that uh, it's been really interesting to see our customers, particularly return customers, coming back and telling us, oh, they really are looking for our Peruvian 85% because they specifically like that kind of grapefruity or raspberry note in it. So just anecdotal evidence, but I would say it's increasing on all those fronts. Sam, I don't know how many how much time we have. I see a question about white chocolate. Um, and yeah, we have time for a couple. I mean, first of all, I mean, as long as people, we can go for a couple more minutes. Yeah, go for it. Okay, sure. So white chocolate, we get this question all the time. How what is white chocolate? How do you make white chocolate? So um, as I mentioned in with the cacao beans, they contain cocoa butter. Cocoa butter. That's where cocoa butter comes from. You talk, which and, you is know, the fat. In which chocolate. is is the fat from the from the bean from the seed. Cocoa powder also comes from the cocoa beans. So uh, that's basically a process of grinding those beans down and then putting them in a hydraulic press and you squeeze the butter out and you're left with a cake of cocoa powder. So if you're making like a chocolate cake, you use the cocoa powder. Cocoa butter gets actually used in all sorts of different stuff. But cocoa butter is uh, what's used to make white chocolate. So you, you're basically removing the cocoa mass and you're just using the fat from the seed and then you're adding sugar and milk typically. And so that would be how you would make um, a white chocolate. Um, the, all of the, you know, thing that Lane mentioned, uh, chocolate being good for the heart and brain and everything, all of those nutrients and things are contained in the cocoa mass. So you're kind of taking that part out when you make uh, white chocolate. Um, and it's just made with that, that fat content from the seed along with milk and sugar. Will chocolate ever make a white chocolate? We have made a white chocolate. Um, all of our chocolate right now is, uh, is, is vegan, it's dairy free. So we've actually made an almond milk white chocolate. Um, and we do a, uh, particularly for the holidays, we do a, this is a really popular uh, a peppermint uh, uh, bar, uh, bark, uh, which in, in, in contains like a, a mint dark chocolate layer, uh, peppermint, um, candy sprinkles in a almond milk white chocolate layer with more peppermint candy. So um, we don't have a bar out right now, but that's sort of a seasonal thing we do. And I would just say if any of you guys, particularly um, in Atlanta, are driving up and down the highways that much, you might have seen the banners that say nut milk is not milk. We're toying around with the idea of calling our almond milk white chocolate made with almond not milk. So maybe you guys can be a little bit of a market research group and cool. whether you like the not milk term. <laughs> okay, I think actually I want to let's. There's one more very important announcement, and I, th I, th I think we should uh, call it a fantastic evening. So the very important announcement uh, that I, I wanted to, to uh, mention. It, well, sorry, two of them. One of them, here, Matt and Elaine, you want to mention the discount before I get to the other important announcement? Announcement. Yeah, of course. Um, Wanted to thank everybody for participating. We wanted to extend an offer out to everybody in class, but also watching on YouTube, 20% uh, off any uh, your next order. Basically, use the discount code NEURO20, and uh, you can do our website is chocolatlechocolate.com, and um, you can use that discount code to get you 20% off. Mother's Day is right around the corner. Right. Father, Father's Day, we don't get as much, but same thing. <laughs> everyone everyone needs and deserves chocolate. Okay, well, thank you everyone so much uh, for joining us. Thank you to, to Matt and Elaine and all of the students. And th thank you all for uh, spending some time with us and eating some fantastic chocolate. So, good night. Thank you, everyone.